Welcome, my friends, to Winslow United Church on beautiful Prince Edward Island. Thanks so much for tuning in and making us part of your worship experience for this week. Now, folks, many years ago, Jesus Christ was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, to love God with all your mind, heart, strength, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That all the law and the prophets fall on these two commandments. And so with that in mind, I want to ask you this question. Is it okay to do a kind act for a selfish reason? Is it okay to do something good, but not have love in your heart? And if not, why not? That's what we're going to be talking about today. And so my friends, I hear Stephanie playing. I see people coming. So come on, let's go praise the Lord. Well, good morning to one and all. I want to thank you. Thank you for coming out and being part of our time here today. My name is Ruth Kennedy. I'm just dressed up like JD today. Pretty good disguise, I have to say. Pretty good disguise. No, no, no. I'm really JD. Uh, just a few things. A few, a few things before we, we start. Before we start up, is that I got a note the other uh, this week. It says. And I'm at the point in my life where my arms aren't quite long enough anymore. It says, Dear Reverend Kennedy, just a little note to say I want to make a donation towards your chili supper. I listen to your service, uh, your church services every week, and I really enjoy the music and the singing. May God bless you all. And then the young lady gives her name. All the way from Miramichi. She's never been to this church before, only through YouTube. She saw that we were having a, a, a church supper, and she said, I can't, uh, I can't make it there, or it might be cold by the time I get it home, because I live in northern New Brunswick. Uh, so i just like to make a donation towards it. And so that was a nice little segue. Number one, it says, you know, geez, Louise, thank you very much for, for, for watching us and, and uh, contributing to our service in, in that way. But I was talking early, early oh, and also... Uh, we have uh, uh, some, some people here to be singing for us. Uh, we have Keela and we have Judy. And I can't remember uh, uh, the guy's names, but I'm told one of them is Martin. And the other guy's name is Martin. And it took me a while to, me to figure that out. I thought they were just stuttering. But we have two Martins, Keela and Judy, and they're going to be singing for us a bit later on. We had them here earlier, uh, uh, earlier in the year, and they were absolutely wonderful. And everybody said, you know, you should have these guys come back and... Uh, so here we are. I heard you, I listened, and here they are. Geez, I feel like uh, Trudeau now, saying, I've heard you and I've listened. <laughs> and several, several months later, you know, here they are, here they are. In the book of Isaiah, it was written, The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. On those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has dawned. That was written 800 years before Jesus Christ came. And the people were left in darkness. The darkness of death, the darkness of depression, the darkness of loneliness. They were left in the darkness wondering, is this all there is? Are we on the outside looking in? Has God provided us a life but only for a short period of time? These things that we do in our lives, is there anything better that we can look forward to? And then one day, the light of Christ, dawn. And the angel Gabriel said to Mary, that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and behold, I great, bring great news of tidings of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And it's then, on that dark night, that a light has dawned. On this day, a light has dawned in our sanctuary. The presence of God is here. And as we have gathered in this place that we call the house of God, as we gather together as friends and family, people of faith, we come together as the people of God. And as the children and the people of God have gathered in this home, 
So let us gather with the word of God on our lips as we say together. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. And then the people of God will say together with me, Amen. On this day, we come on the first day of the week. A brand new beginning is ours. What was once has gone by. We have today, and we look forward to the future. Today is the day that the Lord has brought us together. Today is the day that we come to celebrate. Today is the day that we come to worship and sing praises to God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us stand as we sing as we are able our hymn, This is the Day. following God. And he followed God so faithfully that God made him a promise. He said, Abraham, one day I'm going to make you and your offspring so plentiful that your offspring will outnumber the, the stars. I'm going to give you a land. And you're going to be, your offspring will be the benefit for all people, for from you will come the salvation of all humankind. That's a big promise. A big promise that outlived many lifetimes. And every generation, that promise will be passed down to an offspring. And every time that promise was brought forward, lifted up, and affirmed. But then the children of Israel went into Egypt land and they became slaves. They were no longer a people. They were loose, loose tribes. And they said, 
Is this the end of the promise? Is this the end of the promise? Has our, has our Lord abandoned us? And after generations, the Lord sent Moses in, and he brought them out. And then at Mount Sinai, the promise was again brought up and affirmed. But the people had forgotten what it meant to be the children of God. They'd forgotten who their father was. They knew he was there. They knew him a name, but a name only. And so on Mount Sinai, the finger of God came. The presence of God was there, and the finger of God wrote on stone tablets. And he said, if you were to be my people, this is the law that you need to have. Your society to be based upon that will bring you together. And when you live this way, the people of this world will see that you are my people and that I am your God. And those commands have been passed down from generation to generation to us here today. Indeed, they are the foundation bedrock on all our legal systems. They all seem to flow from here. And so on this day, again, we have gathered we have gathered, not at the base of Mount Sinai, but we have gathered in the house of God. And again, those words are going to echo forth from his people as we say together our Ten Commandments that we can find on our screen. Thou shalt not have any gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's household. As we gather in this place here today, we gather at the first day of the week. And over the, over the weeks and months that we have previous, you know, these are some of the commands that we've been asked to follow. And sometimes we've, we've been good at it, and sometimes they haven't really been brought up. And sometimes, sometimes, we failed miserably. These things, they weigh down on us. First a little, then to more. But they weigh down. But on the first day of the week, as we gather in this place, God says, come to me. Allow me to take these burdens from you. That sack of potatoes that you've been carrying around on the back, you've been carrying it for a long time. It's exhausting you. It's playing out your life. Allow me to take that from you. Lay it at my feet laid at the base of the cross so that when you walk from here you can walk straight and true no longer carrying that heavy burden but being able to follow the path that I give to you so on this, this day let us, come, let, let us come before our God now with our prayer confession and let us pray together loving Father you have given us free will to make our own choices in life. And yet too often we have made choices that have taken us further away from you. Too often we have made the choice to hurt others and ourselves. Forgive us, we pray. On this day, Lord, we are making the choice to come back to you. Forgive us, guide us, and encourage us to live the lives you call us to live. Amen. And Lord Jesus, and now as you hear the confessions of all here who seek you and may truly need you this day, hear now our secret sins and shames that we can share with nobody else, but we know we can share with you.
Be assured. Be assured this day the Lord has heard you. Be sure this day the Lord has forgiven you. Thanks be to God. And amen. I just have just a little story for you here today. I mean, it's, it's Halloween. So I got a little story for you today. Well, I remember when I was a lad, I used to go out with, with some of my friends in school, and we'd go around trick-or-treating. And we'd go and we'd knock on doors and this kind of stuff, and we'd uh, get our get, uh, little treats, and we'd go on to the next door. And, and I remember this one time we were going out, and I was dressed up like the creature from the Black Lagoon. And so I was going out, and I was this fish monster, and I was knocking on doors, and people would pretend to be scared and everything like that. And then we came to this one particular home. And no one was there. But what they did do was they left out this great big pumpkin full of candy. And the idea was to take one. But this was my last stop of the night. And I had a great big pillowcase still in my back pocket that I hadn't touched yet. And so my two friends took theirs and they went on to the next one. And I was left there, and this was a house that was way down the end of a lane, way far away. Nobody was there, and my buddies had already run ahead of me because they wanted to get the good stuff. And I was left with this great big pumpkin full of candy. And I had a choice. Now, there's no sign that said, take one. It was just, a bi- actually, the big sign said, take some. <laughs> That's what the sign said. And, you know, being a, a lawyer in training, I'm sure, I said, you know, if there's no restriction here to take some, take one. I could take as much as I want. And so that left me with a temptation. A temptation, what should I do? Should I take some or one and leave the rest for somebody else who might walk down this long lane in the dark in October? Or should I just take them all and be very grateful that, these, that this family had left them all out for me? When we take a look at our commandments that we just went through, if I was on a desert island, I'd have most of them looked after. Thou shalt not kill. I'm alone on a desert island. I wouldn't have to worry about that. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I'm alone on a desert island. I wouldn't have to worry about that. Thou shalt not steal. There's no one on that desert island for, for me to steal from. Thou shalt not bear false witness against my neighbor. I have no neighbor because I'm alone on a desert island. And thou shalt not covet the neighbor's household. Again, there's no neighbor for me to be jealous of. Are these rules to be slavishly followed? Or is there something more underneath them? When someone leaves out a little tub and a pumpkin that says, take some, do they intend for you to take them all or do you need to look for the spirit behind that note? That was a dilemma that I had that day. And that is a dilemma that I still have with a lot of other things. Like when my wife says, JD, leave some of that pie for faith. Or, J.D., do you need to take all of those? These are some of the temptations that you have. But when you take a look at these rules and regulations, these commands of God, are the only rules that we can say, I've done all of them because I haven't offended them? Or do we need to look for the Spirit behind them and make sure that the Spirit not just the letter of the law, is followed. My friends, that is a temptation that we all have. And that is something that we're going to have to struggle with 
each and every day of our lives. But my friends, as we struggle with them, as we struggle with them, please know that God is only ever a prayer away. And when we struggle with these things, when we bring them to the Lord in prayer, that is when our faith is purified, and that is when we are actually led to a straight and narrow path that will lead us closer to God. And if you're wondering, yeah, I took all the things in the pumpkin, but I feel bad about it today. <laughs> and folks, that's just a little message that I leave with you here this morning. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Now, in this particular passage, in this particular passage, we have been walking with Jesus along his ministry. And last week, we had blind Bartimaeus. And he crawled through this crowd because he knew Jesus was coming. And he knew that Jesus could restore his sight. But here he was, a blind man. He couldn't go find Jesus. But Jesus came, and he was in the very same town as he was, in Jericho, as he was going towards Jerusalem. And so he had to crawl through this crowd because a lot of people wanted to see Jesus. He had to crawl through this crowd. He had to crawl because he was blind. And, you know, on a regular day, he could probably find his way around. But, you know, with the streets full of people, he was afraid he was going to get jostled, fall down, and he had to crawl through this crowd. And he hollered up to Jesus, Jesus, don't pass me by. Help me. And Jesus said, what can I do for you? And he said, restore my sight. And that sight was restored. Now, in and of itself, that's a miracle story. But I always find that these miracles, although they're the kind of things that kind of grab our attention, it's the lesson behind them, or the phrase that comes after that, which is the true lesson. It's like the pumpkin full of candy. We get so fixated on the candy that, you know, the lesson that we find out a little bit later on is the true one. And what it said after that was, he went and he followed Jesus. And the whole idea is, you know, every day we receive miracles. Every day we receive, life itself is a miracle. And every day we are a benefit of miracles. And the whole idea is, how do you choose to respond to those miracles of God? Do you respond with indifference? Or do you respond with gratitude? And Bartimaeus responded with gratitude. Now, it says he goes and he follows Jesus. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Back then, you know, quite literally, he could follow after him and be part of his ministry. But how do you do that today? How can we do that today? And that's what we're going to be hearing about in our, in our scripture lesson, lesson. That's what we're going to be hearing about in our sermon time a little bit later on. One of the teachers of the law came and he heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given a good answer, this teacher of the law came to him and said, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then, no one dared ask him any more questions. And may God bless us our reading and our interpretation of this God's holy word. Amen. Now, folks, 
we're going to have some music. And if we don't, well, I guess I'll hum a few bars and I'll go from there. Anyway, I'll turn it over to people who actually know what they're doing and let them sing. That's Martin over there. That's Martin over there and that's Martin right there. Young Martin, old Martin, Jason.
like to give the little joy now. Why did Jesus Christ come to this earth? Well, you could answer that question in a few different ways. But listen to what it says in the first chapter of Mark. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now John the Baptist Jesus' cousin, the one who had baptized him, he goes to prison. He goes to prison, and Jesus starts his ministry. And the very first recorded words of Jesus Christ in the Bible are the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The first recorded words of Jesus Christ. But why did Jesus come 
to earth to proclaim the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, over the past few weeks, we've walked with Jesus on his ministry. A few weeks ago, a rich young man came to Jesus and he asked him, how do I get eternal life? Now, this rich young man, uh, he came to Jesus and he asked him this question. And this, his, his life had been characterized by professional and moral excellence. He was rich, you know, he knew what he was doing, he, he was good at his business dealings, but he also got his wealth honestly, not cheating or gouging anyone, and he also got it by, by living a very moral lifestyle. And yet Jesus basically sends him packing. And the disciples, they're shocked at this. And they ask, Lord, if you are sending this guy away, who then can be saved? And Jesus answers, no matter how good you try to be, you cannot save yourself. But where it's impossible for you to save yourselves, nothing is impossible for God. In other words, God can and God will save you. Well, then there's a question that comes from that. How then will God save us? Well, we then looked at James and John <clears throat> a little bit later on who, were, who asked Jesus, you know, Jesus, when you become the boss, how about making us your top two lieutenants when you come into your glory? That's their words, not mine. Now, Jesus tells, tells them that the kingdom of God, look, it doesn't work that way. He says, I haven't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And we've all done it. Whether it was intentionally, you know, we knew what we were doing at the time. We were hoping to, to do someone wrong, and, and, and we did it. Whether it was intentional, whether it was by ignorance. Well, we didn't know what we were doing at the time, but, you know, we wish we had done it better. We wish we knew, knew what we know now, back then, but we did it and we hurt somebody. Or maybe it was by accident. You know, we had the best of intentions in, in mind, but it went horribly wrong. Whether it was intentional, through ignorance, or by accident, we've all hurt somebody. We've hurt others, we've hurt ourselves. And we're saddled with a debt that we cannot pay. But Jesus says, he came to pay that debt and to be a ransom for many. And I've said in this church many times, and I'll say it many times, Yet, Jesus came to live the life that we should have lived. He lived a holy and, a holy and sinless life. He, that's the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. He was wrongly accused and paid for sins that were not his own. To give the gift that only he can give. And so from that comes the question. If he has come to pay the debt that we cannot pay, if he has given his life as a ransom for many, how can I ensure that he paid for mine? If he's going to give the gift that only he can give, how can I make sure that I received it? And the answer to that one is simple. Just like blind Bartimaeus last week. Come to him and ask. It's as simple as that. Last week we saw a blind Bartimaeus crawl through a crowd and holler to Jesus to come give him back his sight. And Bartimaeus, he had never met Jesus before. Didn't really know who he was. He didn't follow him. They weren't friends or colleagues. They weren't you know, buddies that went, together, uh, uh, went to the synagogue together that Jesus might know, owe him a favor or be predisposed to help him. Also, Bartimaeus... You know, he was blind. He wasn't a rich and important man. He was a poor beggar. He wasn't rich or important that Jesus might expect some kind of payoff or might be able to do something for Jesus in the future. No. He didn't know Jesus. Jesus didn't owe him anything. And yet all Bartimaeus had to do was come to Jesus and ask. Bartimaeus asked. 
and he received. The same is true for us. And today, today we have a teacher of the law who comes to Jesus and he asks a question. Now, whenever the Bible talks about the law, they're talking about God's law. The Ten Commandments and all the, the rules and the regulations that kind of flow from them. So what does the law have to do with the kingdom of God that Jesus came to proclaim? How do these Ten Commandments, or, or all those rules in Leviticus, help us to understand the kingdom of God? Because remember, Jesus is not here to impress us about his understanding of the law or politics or, or the economy or theology or religion. No. He came to press into us, the people of God, people who have said, I want to take up the cross and follow you, Jesus. He wants to impress into us what it means to live in the light of what he's teaching, about bringing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That was the mission of Jesus Christ then, and that is the mission that the church has been on ever since the resurrection. That is what we're here to do. That's what we're here to understand. And so how does this passage about the law help us to live out the kingdom values right here on earth? Now in this passage, we're going to see three things, I hope. A premise, a command, and a hope. A premise, a command, and a hope. So let's first start with the premise. Now we see right at the beginning of verse 28 that there's a scribe. Now a scribe is a teacher of the law and he comes to Jesus. Now obviously he has overheard Jesus speaking about, about another matter, and this legal scholar was so impressed with this young rabbi that he comes to Jesus and he says, of all the commands, which is the most important? Now this is no small question from a scribe because the commandments, the rules in the books of, of Leviticus, etc., they weren't just a bunch of rules on a page or on a screen. This was life itself. Now, several years ago, I, I used to have a satellite radio in my car, Sirius XM. And I remember I was driving down to Sackville for some kind of church meeting. And I was listening to this documentary about Orthodox Judaism. Yes, that's what we hit ministers listen to in our Sirius XM radio cars. Documentaries about Orthodox Jews. Now, at one point in the documentary, they're in this room with a scribe, and he's transcribing the Torah. And before this scribe would write each letter, he would whisper the letter out loud, and then he would write it. T. H. E. He'd whisper, and he'd write. And he would do this for every letter of every word, of every verse, of every chapter. And he would do this because, of the, because to the scribe, to those who understand the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this was not just a letter or a word or a verse. This was the whisper of the breath of God. This was the whisper of the breath of God. The very God who spoke the world into existence. The very God who said, let there be light, and there was. Our God breathed meaning and life and purpose into this world through speaking, through his word. And he communicated it through his word. And this very word has been recorded in the Torah. It's more than words on the page. It's life itself. Therefore, the premise is that if God has breathed meaning and life and purpose into this world through his word, 
And these words have been recorded in the Torah. Which of these words are the most important? Which of these words will give us life? Which of these words, we can't keep them all. We've tried, we just can't do it. We've tried very hard, we just can't do it. So which should we spend most of our time trying to perfect and hold? What ones are the most important so that we can make sure that we follow them? And Jesus answers this by giving a command. The most important one Jesus answered is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, the first thing, now, a lot of you people have been to church for a long time, longer than me. And when we hear this, we tend to skip to the love God and love your neighbor part. And we ignore the, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And yet this is vitally important to the message that Jesus is giving to the scribe, vitally important to answering the question the scribe is asking. The question is vitally important for us hearing it today. You see these words, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. These were first said by Moses in Deuteronomy 6.4. And these were first said by Moses in a prayer that he was giving to the people just before the next generation of Israel entered into the promised land. Moses says, folks, your parents were born in slavery in Egypt. They couldn't free themselves. But God could and God did. He led them out, he parted the Red Sea, and they came through on the other side. In the desert. Your parents couldn't provide for themselves, but God could. God could and God did. God provided for them. And now he's about to provide for you. You're on the cusp of entering the promised land. And when you go through the River Jordan, you will face challenges. You will face obstacles that will get in your way. You'll face challenges of adversaries who will seek to lay you low. You'll face the challenge of unknown events that you've never ever had to deal with before. And you're going to face, yes, you're going to face the challenge of prosperity. You're entering into a land of milk and honey. You're going to face the challenge of prosperity. And folks, prosperity brings with it its own temptations and hardships. But no matter what you face, always remember there's only one God in heaven. He's your God. He is the one who saved you. He is the one that you can come to, that you can ask questions of, and you can rely on. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And at that time, in that prayer, Moses challenges them with his wisdom and a warning. Because he was, doesn't want these Israelites to repeat their parents' mistakes. Rather, he invites them to respond to God's grace and mercy with love, faithfulness, and obedience. This is what Jesus reminds the scribe of and what Jesus is telling us today. There's only one God, and that God has given you life. That God has provided this world for you to live in, to learn in, he's provided people for you to love and to receive love in return. It's this God and this God only that can and will save you. In fact, he already has. How do you respond to a God who has done all this for you? Well, you can respond by walking away. That rich young ruler who, who came and asked Jesus, that's how he walked away. He walked away, sad, but he walked away. You can respond with indifference. You know, you know, thanks, Jesus, for, you know, for all of creation. Thanks for all the wonders to behold. But I'm going to live my own life now. Thanks a lot. I'm on my way. But Jesus invites the scribe and us here today 
to respond to God's grace with mercy, love, faithfulness, and obedience. Of all these commandments, which is the most important? The most important one Jesus answered is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So how do you do that? How do you respond to God's grace with mercy, uh, grace and mercy with love, faithfulness, and obedience? How do you live your love for God and your neighbor? Well, today, together, we spoke about ten ways earlier. Or we tried to. I was a little bit too quick on the clicker. We tried to say them all together. Those ten commandments. Now, I'd be asked, well, gee, ten, what? Ten commandments? Isn't that what the scribe started with when he asked the question? He said, look, there's too many of these rules. Which one's the most important? Now you're saying, follow them? Didn't we just go full circle? And the short answer is yes. But in Jesus' reply, something clicked. Something clicked for that scribe that never clicked for him before. Listen to what happened. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that, that God is one, that, there is only, that there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he'd answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. For the first time, this scribe, and quite frankly, everyone who was paying attention, realized that love is behind and infused with the intent of these Ten Commandments. If God wanted us, want us to, to slavishly follow rules, he would have left us in Egypt land. You know, we were slavishly following rules as slaves back then. Love is the basis of those Ten Commandments. And you'll never understand the law unless you understand love. And you'll never understand love unless you understand the law. They are integrated so you can, can't divorce one from the other. And Jesus is saying that, that the whole purpose of the law, the whole purpose of these Ten Commandments, is to become a loving person. They are there so that we can give and express our love to God and to one another. Therefore, the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal, can't simply mean that you're fulfilling the law if you say, well, I've never cheated on my income taxes, or I've, I've never brought something home from work, or, or I've never shoplifted. It can't mean just that. Of course, it means that too, but it means so much more. It also must mean that you're respectful of other people's time and effort and property. It also must mean that, that therefore, are you a generous person? Do you give away your time to those who need it? Do you give your money away to those who need it? Do you give away you know, your skills and your talents that you have to benefit other people? See, if the law is given to us to point us to to being a loving life, to having a loving life, then we just can't see it in negative terms. Living on a desert island and saying, I've, I've lived a good life. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That can't just mean don't sleep around on your spouse. Of course, it means that too. But it also means more than that. Do you treat your spouse with respect? Do you beat them? Do you demean or embarrass them in public? Do you love them? Do you love them more than your job? Do you forgive them when they make mistakes? Are they the most important person in your life? Do they know it? 
Do you treat them that way? Do you love them more than you love yourself? You see, when we see the law this way, it's pointing towards a loving life. And it turns it into a far more positive thing than a lot of us are used to and far less oppressive. And yet, far more difficult, far more complicated. But as Jesus says, guys, the law is not there to beat you down. It's there to raise you up, to raise up society so that we can become a loving society, that, that we can live in the kingdom of God right here on earth. And that's why the scribe walked away, blown away. So he heard this, but he had never heard it this way before. And Jesus says, listen, listen to what I'm saying. You need the law, and you need to love, need, need the love, and you need, you need to love the law, you need the love, and you need to have them to work together. And when you do that, you're following me. So that is the premise. Which one's the most important? The command, the love behind all those rules, that's what's important. And finally, where is the hope? Well, no matter how much we try, we can't live a loving life to the people in our lives all the time. We're not perfect. God didn't make us that way. He didn't make us to be perfect. He made us to be human. But while we are not perfect, he is. And what he asks us to do, he is already doing for us. You see, God loves us with all his mind, his heart, his strength, and his soul. In fact, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world, to save you through him, to which I can only say, thanks be to God, and amen. Folks, let's just bow our minds and hearts just for a quick moment in prayer. And loving God, as we gather in your midst here today, Lord, today we, we heard that in following you, there's a way to love in this world. That we are to love you and to love our neighbor. And that you've given us these, these commandments, these beatitudes, to, to show us examples of how to do that in this world. We want to thank you. We want to thank you for all the churches and the ministers and all the people in our lives who have tried to lift this up. And over the years, oh Lord, you know, perhaps we had blinders on, maybe we couldn't hear these words. But on this day, oh Lord, we've heard them today. Helps us to take a look at these commandments, perhaps for the very first time, in a new way. Not the same old way that we learn them in Sunday school, but in a new way. How we do our, honor our parents. The idea about thou shalt not steal, but have respect for other people. Thou shalt not commit adultery, but you know, lift our spouse up. To make sure that they know that they are indeed loved by us. Lord, this is hard. It's a whole lot harder than just following temp simple rules to make sure that the love is there to power these rules. But Lord, where we know that our batteries wear down, that our tanks, you know, empty out, we also know that you are there to fill them back up again. We want to thank you. We want to thank you for the churches that we can come to. 
We want to thank you for, for the beautiful music that inspires our souls. Like the news that we heard today from our guests. And whether they're, you know, Martin and Martin and Keela and Judy. Whether they're the diamond singing beautiful music. Whether it's Ms. McLeod playing her trumpet or our choir or our very own Stephanie Cole with the beautiful music that she provides. We want to thank you for these, these inspirations, this beautiful music, these treasures that, that we get to enjoy. We want to thank you for all the people who have given so much to this church over the years, whether it was in the churches previous to this or this church here. We we'll make sure that the lights are on, that the word of God is spoken and heard. Lord, we want to thank you for the people who come and give of their time and talents to make sure that the people in our community are, receive things that wouldn't be there if we weren't here. And whether they never come through the door, their life is a little bit better because this church is here and that these people have provided. And Lord, on this day, we want to thank you for the love that you've given us that you have loved us with your mind, heart, strength, and soul so much that you came to live with us, to teach us, to inspire us, to die for us, to live again for us, and to open the gates of heaven so that one day we may enter in. And now, O oh Lord, we come to you with the prayer that you've taught us to say when we've come to these places like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, folks, we pretty much come to the end of our time here together, and I want to thank you. I thank you for coming and being part of our time here today. Because when you're here, we feel blessed. And when you're not, you're missed. And however you came to this place here today, whether it be in a car or by yourself, please know that when you came here, you didn't come alone. When you leave here, you don't live alone. For the Spirit of the living God goes with you. And it's my prayer for you that wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever situation you might find yourself in, that you're always able to feel the power and the presence of the living God acting and working in your life because He is there. May you know the peace of God in your life. And may you know the love of Christ in your hearts, in your homes, and in your families. And we are giving out treats later on tonight. If you leave out a pumpkin with a lot of stuff into it, leave a very specific note that says, JD, don't take them all. <laughs> and now may the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen.
end of our time here together, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in and making us part of your worship experience for this week. You know what? It's okay to do good things for selfish reasons. But when you do good deeds with love in your heart, not only will somebody else's life be changed, but your life will change as well. My friends, God is love. And when you do good things with the love in your heart, you're inviting me in. And what happens then? Well, we say it almost every week in our creed. God will work in us and others by the Spirit to reconcile us and make us new. Not only will their life be changed and transformed, yours will be as well. Now folks, you might ask the question, how can you get God into your life? Where can you go to experience God? Well, one place is right here at Winslow United Church. Now folks, our church is open. You've just been through a service. So if you've never been to church before, or you haven't been for a long time, please, please consider this to be your personal invitation to come right here to Winslow United Church and visit us. Get to know God. Get to know His family. Now folks, I realize that we live in uncertain times. So, if you're nervous about coming, please, please continue to tune in. And always remember that God loves you. And so do we. So my friends, until we meet again, and we shall meet again, stay safe. May God bless you. Amen.